Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Can everyone hear me okay? Standing here by the mic? Okay. Uh, my name is Jessica Menick. I'm a registered dietitian, and I'm also board certified in oncology nutrition. And I work at the GHS Cancer Institute as part of the Center for Integrative Oncology and Survivorship Clinic. Um, so a big name, um, but we do a lot of different things there. We call ourselves the everything else to cancer treatment, and that's nutrition, which is my role. Um, but we also do a lot with physical therapy, yoga, music therapy. Um, I believe my coworker was here with you all last month, if you were here, and she talked a lot about what we do. So today we are going to focus specifically on the nutrition piece and how you can use nutrition to help decrease your cancer risk. Um, even if you have a personal history of cancer risk, we can still do these things to help prevent a recurrence or a second cancer. Um, so the topic today is fighting cancer with your fork and um, the plant-based approach is what we're going to be talking about. Um, so before we start talking about what we should be doing, we are going to talk about what our current standard American diet looks like. And the acronym for it is SAD, um, which is a good description of where we're at at this point with our food sources. Um, so as you can see there, 63% of the American diet is from processed foods. And so I like to describe that category as not real food. It's not things you can picture growing on a tree or roaming in a field somewhere. And that's taking up more than half of what we eat. And so we'll talk a lot today about how we can shift that. Um, only 12% comes from plant food. And half of that 12% is actually um, plant food that was mixed in with a processed food. So something like strawberries and strawberry shortcake or <laughs> spinach in a um, you know, toaster strudel or something. Um, and then 25% is animal food, which is really kind of on par with, with what we want. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but in that category, the type of animal food that we're choosing is still not um, where we need to be for our optimal health benefits. So consequences of our SAD or our American diet, I'm sure we've all heard before, um, obesity, diabetes, cancer, hypertension, um, GI issues. We're now linking nutrition to some of our cognitive disorders like Alzheimer's. So there's a lot of things we're learning that are being impacted by our um, daily food choices. So what we talk about is a plant-based diet. So has anyone heard of that before? Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. What do we think about when we say plant-based diet? Fruits and veggies, absolutely. So we have a couple different classic definitions of what's considered a plant-based diet. Um, the ones on the right are probably ones you've heard at some point. We have a vegan, which is no animal foods whatsoever. We have a lacto-ovo-vegetarian, which is no animal flesh but dairy and eggs. Pescatarian would include fish. And then we even have a new term now, a flexitarian, which will really fit in well with what we'll talk about today. Um, one thing about these terms is that they only focus on what you don't eat. They do not actually tell you what you should eat. So I've met plenty of um, vegans that like to eat Oreos every day, and I'm not sure that's necessarily plant-based. That's just <laughs> the absence of animal products. Um, so we use the term plant-based because it tells us what we include. We include mostly plant foods. And that's really the direction we want to be going in. So we don't have to take out all the animal products. We just want to include more plants than anything else. And that's really our big take home of what we're talking about today. So if you remember anything, eat more plants, less animals. And that's the balance we're looking for. Um, a lot of these terms on the right are also, um, people will follow these sort of diets or exclusion of the animal products for a lot of reasons other than health. They might do it for environmental or um, humanitarian reasons. And so that's another reason we've really, as um, a health community, gotten away from using the terms vegetarian and try to go more towards plant-based. So what is plant-based? So um, what I encourage all of my patients to do is find your own definition of plant-based. Think about strategies you can use to add more plants in your day. So these are just a couple things that um, come up when people are trying to figure out their plant-based approach. Meatless Monday has become a very popular one. So one day a week you just don't eat meat. The other days you can include it. Um, minimally processed foods. So some people might say I'm just going to try to eat the least processed foods that I can. By nature that would include a lot of plant foods. Um, vegetarian is certainly a word that describes it. Mediterranean, we'll talk about that as we go. That's a plant-based approach. Um, different food choices than what we might see um, here in the U.S., but still fits in our plant-based idea. Vegan is certainly part of that. 
healthy plate model we'll talk about today as well, which can also help shape um, a plant-based diet for you. So the other thing we want to focus on, like I mentioned the Oreos, we have whole foods and we have processed foods. So the idea is that we eat a colorful plate of whole foods grown from the ground, not a colorful plate of processed things like Fruit Loops and Cheerios, whatever is on there. Um, the interesting thing is this plate on the right is actually a vegetarian plate, right? So again, it points why we don't use that terminology anymore, and we really try to think whole foods, mostly plant-based. So our benefits are very long. Um, the plant-based diet has been the research the longest as far as its heart health um, benefits, but we're also learning how it can help um, people obtain a healthy weight, how it can help prevent hypertension, diabetes, um, and what we'll talk a lot about today is how it can help prevent cancer. So these are just some statistics that was done from an Adventist health study, which was of about 100,000 people, so pretty convincing information. 8% um, reduced risk of overall cancer. The cancer rates we saw the biggest impact on, and we've seen this in multiple studies, is on any form of colorectal cancer, and that's at 45 to 60% reduced rate. Um, so that's a big impact, especially if you have a family history or personal history of that type of cancer. 48% uh, reduced mortality in breast cancer survivors, so even if you've had a cancer, we're finding that a plant-based diet is helping you still live longer past surviving that cancer. And then 35% reduced rate for prostate cancer. And these are some of our highest rates of cancer in the U.S., so it's really great to see the impact our nutrition can have on it. Um, so when we look at plant-based, another reason we don't say we need to completely take out all of our um, animal products is there's really not a concrete information on are we getting the benefit by taking out the meat or are we getting the benefit by adding the fruits and vegetables and whole grains? The answer is probably both. Um, we certainly increase the antioxidants we take in by doing more plant foods. We also minimize some inflammatory foods by trying to minimize the ana, um, animal products like the meats and some of the higher fat dairy. Um, a lot of what they also found was that people that follow this plant-based diet have a lot of other healthy habits. Um, they drink more water, they exercise more, and they don't smoke. Um, so a lot of our research is pointing to the big picture of a healthy lifestyle, and that's what gives us our biggest risk reduction for cancer. Um, we can't just say blueberries are going to reduce our cancer risk and I'm going to eat them every day and not worry about anything else and, and, be, and expect to have a reduced risk. We've got to look at the big picture and think about all the habits that are creating um, our health. All right, another reason we can go plant-based, and so this is one that I get questions on a lot. So I know you have the picture in front of you, but does anyone know what the most expensive thing in your grocery cart is? Meat. It's meat. I'm so glad we all know that. All right, and so the cheapest thing to replace it is actually plant proteins. And so if you even look at this comparison, one pound of ground chuck is $4.25 for four people. Um, a pound of beans is $1.49, and that's for eight people. So swapping out your beans for meat even once a week is a way to save money and to better your health. Um, peanut butter compared to deli meat is way cheaper, and I don't have the exact amounts on there, um, but that's another easy switch. Twice a week you do a peanut butter sandwich instead yes. of deli meat. <laughs> health benefit and cheaper. Do we like peanut butter sandwiches? Uh -huh. oh, yeah. I eat one every day. It's my favorite food. <laughs> okay. Um, and so while there is certainly sometimes there's an associated increased cost when we look at more fresh fruits and vegetables, but if we can save by buying less meat, um, it can help balance out that cost a lot. So think about those places where we save, replace it with a cheaper protein, gives you a little bit more room for stocking up on fruits and vegetables. So our healthy plate model is a really great way to think about how we build in this plant-based approach. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen the healthy plate model because it is our new My Pyramid. It's now a plate that they use to describe the balance we want to have. Um, and it's a lot more helpful than the pyramid because we can think about this on a meal-to-meal -meal basis. So if you're sitting down looking at your plate, half your plate should always be filled with fruits or vegetables. A quarter of your plate then should be filled with whole grains and starchy vegetables. So the starchy vegetables are potatoes, peas, corn, and beans. Those are all healthy foods. If you've heard before that they're not, that's not correct. Um, the part of it though is that you can put potatoes in that small quarter of the plate, remembering vegetables are still gonna fill the other half. 
um, how you prepare them can also impact how healthy they are. But um, those foods as a whole actually are still plant-based and they're unprocessed most forms that we buy them. And then we have a quarter of our plate is left for protein. So even if you continue to include chicken, beef, fish, whatever it might be in that corner of the plate, 75% of your plate is still plant-based. That is a plant-based diet without completely taking the meat out. Now if you add, let's say maybe you add beans or nuts as your protein there, now we have a 100% plant-based meal and that's always a great option too to do a couple times a week. Um, but the thing to remember is we do not have to take meat out to still follow this plant-based approach that we're going for. All right, so what we're going to do is go through five steps. And so hopefully this will help you think of sp some specific things that you can do at home that can help you work towards developing this pattern of a plant-based diet. So number one, fruits and vegetables. And I'm sure we've all heard before that we are going for five cups a day. Who here thinks they get five cups in a day? Lots of people, OK. So a cup is about the size of your fist and we're aiming for five so that should be about two fruits and three vegetables across the day um, your berries are some of the highest antioxidant fruits and your dark greens are going to be your highest antioxidant vegetables so if you don't think the five cups is a realistic place to start start by including the fruits and vegetables that give you the biggest nutritional value for having a serving um, when you eat dark greens which would include spinach kale um, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, turnip greens, that's like eating all the colors of the rainbow from a food perspective. We get our widest variety of nutrients. Um, so if there's anything vegetable wise, do greens once a day and you'll get a lot of good nutrition. Um, fresh and frozen are our ideal sources of our fruits and vegetables. During the winter time especially, frozen really becomes your best option. Um, Food travels a lot farther over the winter months to get to us. So by the time it gets here, it's not as fresh. It gets a lot more expensive and we don't always like it as well because it tends to waste pretty fast by the time you get it home. Um, canned is still a great option as well. Um, if you have to pay attention to salt, then look for the low sodium cans. Um, one really easy trick is open your canned vegetable, canned bean, and just rinse it under the sink before you use it and then you can add your own seasoning back in that doesn't contain salt. Really easy way to make your own low sodium version of them. Um, canned fruits also work really well. Um, our biggest thing here is paying attention to what is actually in that fruit cup. And so we want it to be packed in 100% juice, not in any of the syrup. So that would be the key thing to look for there. Um, frozen fruits work really well. Um, if you like smoothies, that makes something really easy to throw it into. Um, otherwise, we're getting into the winter months here, and so oatmeal is a nice hot cereal, and you can throw frozen fruit into that, and it will thaw you know, by the time you're ready to eat it. So there's um, a lot of easy ways to add some of these um, preserved fruits and vegetables throughout the winter months. Um, dried fruit would be another great option that's really easy to keep on hand. Yep? Got a question. You sure. Mentioned, you mentioned turnip grains there a while ago. Yeah. Is turnips good for you, too? Absolutely. How about yep. if you put uh, regular vinegar on it? Vinegar is an awesome choice as well. Yep, great question. So um, when we prepare our vegetables, that's certainly something to consider. So vinegar is a great way to add flavor that doesn't add calories, and vinegar is still um, from a plant. Versus using fat back would then be adding that animal source. So that would be a perfect way to do it. Um, vinegars, lemon juices, broths are also really great ways to cook your greens. Great question. All right, number two. Limit added sugar. So this is really addressing the processed foods um, aspect. And so this is a really challenging one for a couple of reasons. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about sugar. So first, the limit, the added sugar is 24 to 36 grams per day. So men get three more teaspoons than women, which is never fair. They get more of everything. Um, but that's what it is. So, um, so with the added sugar, this is sugar that is added to cereals, it's added to sweets, it's added to yogurts, it's added to sweet tea, soda. Um, it's really in a lot of different things. And so we have to be really aware of where this added sugar comes into play. So when we talk about the 24 to 36 grams, this does not count fruit, and it does not count sugar that naturally exists in dairy products. 
um, being plain yogurt or milk. Um, so does anybody pay attention to sugar in their foods or read the label? A lot of people that read the label. Very good. Um, so a good way to pay attention to it is look for less than 7 grams of sugar per serving on things that are not naturally sweet like the milk or the fruit. Um, one thing that makes it really challenging is on our label right now, they only have one, um, one number for sugar. And that includes natural and it includes added. Um, they have approved by the FDA that they will now separate added sugar and natural sugar. Um, so in 2017, manufacturers will start working on revamping their label and separating those numbers out. Um, I would guess we can expect to start seeing it by the end of um, next year. But that's definitely something that will make it easier to be aware of that number. Yep. Not to be cynical, but the manufacturers are claiming that, oh, we can't make that change fast enough. And yet tomorrow they will come out with a new and improved whatever. <laughs> sure. So, label. so our food industry has a lot to do with the types of foods that are available the marketing strategies that they use to sell us their food and so it makes it it makes it very challenging um, and they have already got an extension on on that so you are exactly right in um, saying that um, biggest source of added sugar in anyone's diet is if you drink sweet tea or soda and so if you're looking to take out um, sugar that is the number one place I would start because you will get the biggest benefit by taking it out so I have some some sugar bags here. All right, so this is a medium sweet tea, which is considered 20 ounces, so probably about that much. Does anyone want to guess how much sugar they think might be in a medium sweet tea? A lot. Do we think it's more than 36 grams? Yeah, 45 grams of sugar. Okay, so one 20 ounce sweet tea, and we've already overdone it for the day. And that's not counting all the places that sugar really gets added. Even in our health marketed foods, sugar is added into everything. If you're not buying it fresh, check for sugar because it might be in there. Um, I got two more. We'll try to guess a few others. We got an Oreo milkshake. Does anyone want to guess that? <laughs> all right, an Oreo milkshake is 90 grams of sugar. Okay. You'd have to split that up across four days, I think, and make that, make that work. Um, the other one I'll point out um, is a frappe or any of the Starbucks drinks um, are another notorious one for being very high in sugar. And so this is a medium, which I believe their medium is 16 ounces, and this has 49 grams of sugar in it. Um, so that's why I'm saying when you can take the sugar out of your drink sources, you're really taking a lot out. Um, you don't have to nitpick every little sugar source in your diet, but find the ones that are the largest and see how you can minimize those. Um, if you're a person that just drinks on sweet tea all day, then just think about how can I start reducing it. Um, I'm a big believer that you don't have to take anything out of your diet completely. We've just got to learn how to balance it and keep it within an amount that really is okay for our health. One teaspoon is how many grams? One teaspoon is four grams of sugar. Great question. What about your artificial sweeteners? Artificial sweeteners. So artificial sweeteners have not been proven to increase cancer risk. So um, our stance on it is that they are a better alternative um, than your sugar. And so we know excess sugar contributes to diabetes, obesity, mm -hmm. um, and we've seen more convincing evidence that that sugar is related to cancer than we do with artificial sweeteners. Um, in a perfect world, I would say everybody sticks to this amount of sugar and doesn't use an artificial sweetener to help you get there. Um, but I would use that as a starting place to help reduce that total sugar. Um, and so I'll tell you my perspective from artificial sweeteners, the number one thing I see with it is that it makes people crave more sweets because it is seven to 800 times sweeter than just regular sugar. So we drink a Diet Coke and that's great because we saved calories, but if it makes you crave chocolate cake every day, how much, how much are we saving? Um, the other thing is because it's so sweet, then when we go to eat fruit, something naturally sweet, that fruit just doesn't taste as sweet anymore. So it doesn't satisfy that natural urge for something sweet. We still like maybe the strawberries, but we still need something else to actually give us that sweetness we're looking for. So um, the more you can just minimize your total sugar, sweeteners here and there as you need them, um, but try to not overdo it on those either for that reason. Any other questions on sugar? Doctors are recommending that you do not use artificial sweeteners. 
It probably depends on which doctor you know that you're talking to and there might be different reasons for that as well. Um, nutrition is very specific to each individual and so there are certainly recommendations that I might tell somebody that has heart disease which might be different from somebody that's going through chemotherapy. So it could be very dependent too on what's going on with each person. If I remember correctly, one teaspoon of sugar is something like 16 calories? Um, yes, 16 calories, you are correct. Yep. What type of milk do you suggest we drink? There's so much controversy on whether you get the nutritional value if you drink the one percent sure. as opposed to the whole. What do you suggest? So I think that can be very specific for each person. Um, there's been a lot of convincing yeah. things saying whole milk is better yeah. because it doesn't spike blood sugar as much. Um, my thought on it is if you have a well-balanced diet and you're not having a lot of high fat fried foods or a lot of red meat, whole milk will fit just fine and you're not going to be over your saturated fat content. Um, but if we're looking at someone that really needs to start cutting fat out um, from as many sources as they can, then really fat-free milk might be a better choice. So, uh, are these still related to sugar? The sugar? Yep. <coughs> Okay, so almond and soy milk, um, they can be good alternatives if you do not tolerate um, cow's milk. Um, the downside of them is they're not a protein source, so they don't fill you up. Many of them have more added sugar than what's naturally found in our cow's milk. So that you have to be um, a little picky about when you're choosing your product. Last one. Great question. So she asked about stevia, which is um, it's a natural sweetener, but it's still a processed sweetener. Um, not a lot of research related to it, but I would definitely consider that a good choice. It's not nearly as sweet as Splenda. So I don't think we see the taste changes and sensitivities as much with that um, stevia. Or Truvia is a similar product, and those are both great options that are um, made from a plant. I use Truvia. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes, and so um, using the sweeteners, you can start to decrease your total sugar and add the sweetener to get it up to that level of sweetness that you like. So that's an excellent way to start cutting down on some of the sugar and still getting that flavor that you want. All right, we'll keep moving forward. I, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end as well, um, but feel free to ask them as we, we come across them. Um, so number three, include plant proteins daily. Um, this is a true fact and um, recommendation, even if you don't want to cut out meat at all. Um, they have a lot of benefits. We find a lot of fiber, we find healthy fats, um, and because they're grown from the ground, we still find antioxidants, vitamins, and minerals. So plant protein should be a part of everyone's day. Um, that's going to be things like seeds, nuts, beans, soy. Um, and then if you want to take that step further, find a couple opportunities throughout the week that you can start using these proteins in place of the animal protein, like we talked about peanut butter sandwich instead of a deli meat sandwich. Um, chili, you could do more beans and even half the meat or take the meat out completely. So look for those opportunities that um, you can optimize on the plants that you're actually using there. So I brought a couple. Um, Lentils is one, sorry, lentils is one that um, is a really quick plant protein to use. Does anyone here use lentils? Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Awesome, yep. okay. So they cook in way less time. They take about 20 minutes to cook on the stove top. Um, a lot of people like them better because they're not as mushy, if you will, um, than the bean is. And you can get green lentils, red lentils, brown lentils. Um, so that's something really easy that you could make it into a soup or just have it as your side dish um, in place of rice. Um, another one I brought, I brought flax seeds and hemp seeds and these are getting a lot more popular so I'm sure you've heard of them before. Um, so flax seeds is an anti-inflammatory food, high in omega-3s. Um, one thing you should know about flax seeds, to get all the benefits out of them, you should grind them before you eat them. Um, so then you can throw them in oatmeal, yeah. yogurt, smoothies, and soups, and they get all in your teeth. They are wonderful for that. Yes, absolutely. Um, let's see. So another alternative, hemp seeds are not quite as popular yet as flax seeds. Um, and you all can look at these when we're done if you want to see what they look like inside. Um, hemp seeds are very soft, so they do not get stuck in your teeth as much. Um, and they blend up a lot better than flax seeds do because they're soft. 
Um, they're just as high in omega-3s. They're actually a little bit higher in protein and fiber. Um, so this is my favorite seed to use. Um, if you stick it out on your kitchen counter, you would be surprised how many places you can add these. Um, they're really great in salad dressings, in sauces. Um, so this could be your one easy way to add a plant protein every day um, to something that you're already Hemp eating. Hemp seeds. Hemp seeds, yep. So I will say they're a lot easier to find at a specialty store like Trader Joe's, um, Whole Foods, Garner's, things of that place. But hopefully Publix and some of the other stores will come around to selling them. They're a great, great nutrition source. Oh. The other thing I wanted to mention on here is the use of soy, um, which would be tofu and tempeh. So is anyone here familiar with using those products? Probably not as familiar. So um, one, they're cheap, like we mentioned. It's a really cheap alternative to meat, um, but it's very quick and easy to cook. So you can cook tofu in under 10 minutes. And so that's just a really fast thing that you can add. Um, all it takes is adding a marinade, which I like to use any olive oil based dressing, um, and just pan searing it on the, on the stove top. Um, you can chop it in cubes and add it into any soup and add your protein that way. It doesn't taste like anything at all. Um, it's like the culinary sponge, so whatever you add to it as flavor is what it's going to taste like. So it's pretty neat in that sense that you can take it and really make it into anything that you want it to. Um, tempeh is a fermented form of soy, and I personally like it a little better because it has flavor and texture. Um, that one takes a little bit more learning how to really deal with it and cook it. Um, but both of these things you can find in any grocery store, and they're always in the produce section since they are um, a plant food. All right, number four is including more whole grains. So whole grains, along with beans, um, in a recent study was actually found to help protect against breast cancer more than fruits and vegetables. Um, and that was not to discount fruits and vegetables, um, but what they think the reason is, is because of how high of fiber our whole grains and beans are. The more fiber we have in our diet, um, the better we have with glucose management, um, our GI tract is working better with more fiber, and so um, I know whole grains get a bad rap sometime, or grains in general do, um, but they're really something we should be actively including every day. Um, so whole grains should be included three times a day. Um, so think about the places that you can include those. Um, I think whole grains are also one of the more confusing things to shop for, um, and that goes back to our marketing and our labeling that really makes it a challenge to find. So just for starters to explain, whole grain is an umbrella category. Whole grain is any grain grown from the ground that when you eat it, its whole part is still intact. You're eating the whole part of that plant. Um, I always think of it as whole nutrition. We're getting all the benefits that that plant had to offer. So wheat is one of our most common whole grains that we think of. So whole wheat is a type of whole grain. Um, but there are a lot of other whole grain options if you don't like whole wheat products. So you could try using oats, you could use wheat berries, you could use barley, um, brown rice, black rice. There's really a lot of different options that you can include. Um, and so some of my jars down here, and I'll pull them up at the end, um, I have black rice in here and wheat berries and barley, if you want to just see what those look like. Um, Whole Foods is a pretty neat place to go because they have wholesale grains there. Even if you don't want to buy anything there, you can see what are, there's 20 plus types of whole grains that you can buy there. Um, and when you buy your grains as just one ingredient, you really know you're getting an unprocessed whole grain product versus when we buy breads and cereals, we might be getting a whole grain, but we're probably getting a lot of other stuff with it. Um, so try to think of ways to include those. Um, the key thing when you're looking on a package is 100% whole. It might be 100% whole oats, 100% whole wheat, but the 100% whole is your most important part that you want to look for. Um, the other thing I would encourage you to look for when we're trying to pick whole grains is paying attention to the sugar. And we talked about that earlier, but grains are probably one of the most common places after sugary drinks that we get our added sugar. Um, especially with you know, marketing to kids' products, we'll find that now the cereals are 100% whole grain, and so mom wants to go buy that for kid. And, um, but then the sugar is you know, 15 grams in a little half cup. And so you know, we got one benefit, but then we've just used half our sugar for the day. So just be really aware of um, marketing that even if we've 
got you know our whole grains are we paying attention to the sugar aspect of that as well okay so the next one is when we have animal products and I do think they fit into a balanced diet like we've talked about um, a lot of it though is picking the right ones and so first and foremost red meat is one of the biggest things we want to try to minimize um, when we looked at that 45 to 60 percent reduced rate of colorectal cancer the elimination or reduction of red meat is where we think people are getting the biggest benefit. Um, so let's say you don't want to cut meat out at all, but maybe you can cut down on red meat and replace it with chicken or fish. Um, the other next big thing in our meat category is processed meats. So we talked a lot about some of the processed grains and things we don't want to be including. Um, processed meats is kind of a, a double whammy when we look at it. it's an animal product and now it's also processed. So that would include bacon, hot dogs, sausage, pepperoni, deli meats are also included in there. Um, one thing that we've learned about processed meats though is that the nitrates are what's causing our increased cancer risk. And so the food market has responded to that and now they make a lot of meat products that are nitrate free. So that's something I would encourage you to look for if you're buying deli meat or bacon and you still want to include those, um, look for the brands that say nitrate free. Um, any brand that's nitrate free is going to advertise it because they want you to know they've made their product better for you. Um, Aldi's has a great brand of nitrate free things. Um, any grocery store you go into will have them, but, but really pay attention to that label. Um, the next thing then is picking our leanest ones. And this is really from a heart health perspective and from a weight perspective, um, but trying to pick your leanest option. So your chicken, um, pork chops and pork tenderloins are considered lean and a white meat, so those are a great addition. Um, fish, we should try to include um, once or twice a week, um, especially our salmon, tuna, haddock, sardines, if anybody likes those, um, to try to get some of those healthy fats in. Canned tuna and canned salmon are excellent sources of fish. Um, most of them are actually wild caught in those cans, so you're getting a very good product that could replace your deli meat. So maybe you don't want the peanut butter sandwich, but you can make a tuna salad sandwich instead, and now you have an unprocessed, healthy protein compared to the deli meat. Um, and then this also would cover our dairy option, which we've kind of talked about. So the current recommendation does still say to choose low-fat dairy. Um, and I think we're just learning that there's a lot of different options. And if we look at the big picture of someone's diet, whole milk can certainly fit in there. Um, but certainly there's always going to be instances where the low-fat or fat-free really might be a better option for that person. Um, my kind of end point with the dairy would be two servings a day is really what we're going for. Um, so even if you have whole fat dairy, if you only have it twice a day, it's probably not going to add up to be that much extra fat in your day anyway. Um, our main purpose of having dairy in our diet is for calcium. So if you do not have dairy, um, you could certainly look to our dairy alternatives for that. Um, and that is one big thing almond milk and soy milk have done for us that people that don't like or can't tolerate cow's milk now have an easy calcium source. So they certainly make for good alternatives um, in some instances. Um, the other thing that we know about meats is our cooking method can be very important. Um, aside from the fat content if we fry things, the other thing we've actually learned is that very high temperatures on meat are making them more carcinogenic, um, which is very interesting, but it's changing um, the structure of the iron that's in our meat, and they think that's what's causing some increased rates of colorectal cancer. Um, so it's recommended low and slow is the best idea for cooking meat, which is easier said than done strategy sometimes, especially if you're trying to get stuff um, cooked quick or if you like stuff on the grill. Um, so don't feel like you can never grill or can't you know, pan fry, um, but if you have the opportunity to use your slow cooker, that's always a really great way to cook your meat. All right, so we've talked a lot about pros processed foods. Um, so my last point on this will just be um, something I tell all my patients to think about is if you're picking a food, picture if you can see it growing on a tree or in a plant, and if you cannot, then that's a food we shouldn't have that often. Um, so if you can picture Pop-Tarts on a tree, it's kind of a silly thought. So just not something we should have a lot of. Um, same can go with meat. If we picture a chicken breast, that's a very natural part of the chicken. It's a great way to include protein. Um, chicken nugget is not our natural anatomy of the chicken. And so we just don't want to have that source of it as often. And that's just an easy way without looking at every ingredient and every number to evaluate what your food choices are. 
All right. Really, the last big topic we'll talk about today is going to be organic. So I'm sure a lot of people have heard um, or thought about organics. And so I won't read the whole definition, but you have it there for you. Um, so research is very mixed on organics. There is not a clear picture if organics provide more nutrition. Um, a lot of studies actually show that they do not. And there's also not clear information on, on if pesticide residues actually increase cancer risk. Um, so we're kind of at a limbo between that. Um, there's a list that's out called the Dirty Dozen. Have some people heard of that before? Okay, so the Dirty Dozen is put out by the Environmental Working Group. So one important thing to consider with nutrition information, because it seems that everybody is giving it these days, um, is where that information is coming from and why that group might be promoting something. So. The Environmental Working Group promotes organics solely on the fact that they are environmentalists. It actually does not have to do with health. Um, that doesn't mean organics don't, might not have a health benefit, but just think about where sometimes these guidelines might come from. Um, so what they put out, though, is a list every year they update it um, based on their testing of U.S. products. So it's also an important thing to consider because many of the foods we eat do not come from the U.S. But this list is on U.S. produce. And so the Dirty Dozen are the 12 produce that are tested highest with pesticide residue. So if you're going to spend the extra money and the extra effort to find organic, these 12 would give you the biggest benefit potentially. Their Clean 15 list is 15 produce items that have no pesticide residue, regardless if you bought them from a conventional farm or from an organic farm. So those would be fine to just buy from the conventional farmer um, because it would save money um, and certainly be easier to find. Um, so with all that said though, um, even in the group that very highly promotes organics, their statement is a diet high in fruits and vegetables outweighs the risk of pesticide residue. Um, so if you can work on shopping organics, there's a potential benefit, but don't feel like if you can't buy organics, that means we shouldn't eat fruits and vegetables at all. Um, so the more fruits and vegetables you get in, regardless what type of farm they come from, that's going to give you your biggest health benefit. And then there might be an added benefit if we buy organic, especially in that dirty dozen category there. Does that make sense? Any questions on the organics? Sure. Oh, this might not be with this, but uh, how about honey versus Honeycomb and so forth. So as far as a sugar type? No. Okay. So honey is always an interesting one because it is considered a natural sugar. Um, but when we think about sugar in fruit and dairy, the sugar there comes with a health benefit, um, being fiber, vitamins, minerals. And honey doesn't have that. They don't really have an additional benefit unless you eat local honey and, and then we can get it for our allergies and that can be helpful for a lot of people. So honey's kind of in the middle and what I always tell everyone is count honey towards your added sugar for the day so that you're aware of, of that extra sugar we're adding but know that the honey is still probably a better sugar source than this this processed sugar here um, same would go for maple pure maple syrup um, molasses things like that that really are pure sugar um, think of them as better options but still count them in our added sugar for the day all right so Last thing we'll do is just think about some quick ways we can start working on implementing some of the things we talked about today. So first thing is starting to decrease your meat intake, and that can be the Meatless Monday. Um, it could be eliminate the meats that you won't miss. So a lot of people might say, well, maybe my spouse really likes pork, so I just eat it when I cook it for them, but I could really go without. Then go without. Put some beans there instead. Um, and find those little opportunities that it won't really even impact what you like to eat. Um, reduce the portions of your meat. So if we think back to the healthy plate model, the meat was a very small portion of our plate. And so without even taking the meat away, if we just cut that portion down to our true three ounce portion, you're reducing your total meat intake. And that's a really reasonable way to start working on it. Um, and then focus on the unprocessed meats um, when we do include them. And then start with small changes. So it's always overwhelming to think of a a big picture or lifestyle change, but think of those small things that you can do every day that are going to improve your health. Um, making sure your whole family's on board. So it's really hard if you have someone in the house that wants to eat Little Debbie cakes and you know some of the sugary things, and you want to you know work on doing more plant food. So 
see if you can come to a middle ground and get everybody on board because it will make it a lot easier um, and everyone can benefit from healthier choices. Yep. Raw sugar, my answer would be the same as the honey. Um, it is a less processed version, but I'd still count it in your total added sugar for the day. Yep. What about your meals? Explain the non-fat, the 1%, 2%, whole meal. Okay. So we talked about the milks a little bit already, and I think that's really going to depend on um, each individual person. So if cholesterol is really an issue for someone, I'm still going to probably tell them to do low-fat or fat-free milk. Um, you know, if someone's just trying to get a whole whole foods diet and they don't have you know much fat in their diet and they love the whole milk and they drink it once a day it can certainly stay there um, the protein content and vitamin D and calcium are exactly the same in all of the milks the only different across milks is their fat content um, and it ranges from zero grams of fat up to eight grams of fat which is what we find in whole milk um, so that's truly the only difference and so that's why the fat content will really just depend on what each person needs specifically. Based on recent research, I think I'll have to go with whole milk as, as a better choice for someone with diabetes. I would. Unless we complicated it with some, some heart issues. But yeah, that's what I would go with. Okay. Um, did you say why? Okay. I'll explain real quick because we still have some time. So um, because milk is a really a fairly high carbohydrate food. It has 12 grams, of, actually 15 grams of carbs, 12, 12 of them are sugar, in one eight ounce glass. That's a carb choice that's very similar to a small banana. Um, but with milk, or with any carbs I should say, um, anytime you add protein or fat, it takes your body a longer time to break down that glucose for it to go to your bloodstream. So instead of just having regular carbs that might spike your blood sugar really quickly, Anytime we add fat or protein, we get this slower rise in blood sugar. Um, so it's all about, it just takes your body longer to break down that additional nutrient that's in there. So, you're welcome. What about somebody that's struggling with their weight? What kind of milk? That I'd probably go more on the low fat end. Yep. Um, focus on the positive short term outcomes of making changes. So I know today was largely talking about disease prevention, um, but that's a really hard motivator day to day because when we're sitting down having a meal, it's hard to say, well, I'm going to get this benefit in five years from now. Um, so think of things that you'll benefit from in three months, one month. And it might be that you have better energy. It might be your digestion gets better by eating better. Um, it might be that you want to include more healthy fats for skin care um, and things that we can see in the short term because disease prevention is not something we really see um, and there's never an ending point of disease prevention. It's something we always do. Um, but there's a lot of goals related to nutrition that are short term that we can see results as we go. So try to focus on some of those things that you'll get out of it as well. Um, and then incorporate exercise, which we didn't talk about a ton, um, but that certainly goes hand in hand with our nutrition. Um, it doesn't even have to be exercise. Um, I just tell everybody, just move. And that might be in five minute increments, it might be in 30 minute increments, um, but try to move as much as you can throughout the day. Um, because our body is so much connected with how we move and how we eat, a lot of people find that if they're moving more, they're just thinking more about, well, what am I putting in my body? Am I gonna have energy to go for my walk? Or, I just put all that energy into walk. I want to eat something good now. Um, so they really do help, you know, work together when we're thinking about goals. All right, so that is the end of my presentation, but we have about 10 minutes, so I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any more.